The adoption of optical media represented a turning point in the video game industry. CD rounds were cheaper to produce and more importantly, offered what at the time felt like unlimited space. But there was an unanticipated snag just under the surface. Cartridge-based games typically stored their saves on various chips within their durable plastic shells, while early disc-based console expansions used internal memory allocated for save files. After all, I don't think that most people thought about where their save files were stored, so this made logical sense. The idea of a separate proprietary memory card being a required purchase for saving game data was a novel, if controversial, decision with the release of the Sony PlayStation but they certainly proved to be a pretty great alternative to limiting internal storage and clunky RAM cards. In a previous episode, we looked at a variety of ways to back up, transfer, and otherwise preserve save files for cartridge-based systems, whether they were generated on an emulator, flash device, or original cartridge. Now, let's turn our focus to the memory cards that were used with the early PlayStation consoles, the Sega Dreamcast, Nintendo 64, GameCube, and maybe a couple of others in between. Most of the people that I've talked to that played games during the fifth generation of consoles seem to have a story about the time they had to leave their system on overnight to play through a game because they either didn't know that they needed a memory card, the store was sold out, or they couldn't afford one after buying the system and a game. In retrospect, memory cards are perhaps the ultimate save medium, with the data being free from a game cartridge and not imprisoned within the console. They're easy to copy, bring to friends' houses, and basically do whatever you like with them. And you know what? They're just kind of neat. They look almost collectible in a way. PS1 memory cards are divided up into 15 blocks. In most cases, each save slot accounts for one block, or about eight kilobytes of a standard memory card's 128 kilobytes of memory. Best of all, they use flash memory, so there's no need to worry about replacing lithium batteries or anything like that. Some games, such as Suikoden, may use two blocks per save, or some games may use an additional separate block for system data. A few more generous games, like Klonoa, may offer multiple save slots while only using one block. There's also a select few games that have no qualms with taking up the whole darn thing. Man, I just hate thinking about how many PS1 saves I probably had to delete over the years because I only had a single card for the longest time. If you had more than one, then I'm sure you remember juggling saves back and forth using the memory card manager menu on the PS1. Even then, things can get unwieldy since you have to keep track of what saves are on each. I mean, I had to make a separate spreadsheet to help me remember where everything was. Some third-party memory cards offered additional space, but they had a reputation of being a bit flaky due to how they compress data, so I tend to do avoid using them. Sony continued the use of memory cards with the release of the PlayStation 2. Those memory cards offered a spacious 8 megs of storage, which <laughs> felt downright luxurious at the time. Plenty of space to feel comfortable, except that the PS2 saves tend to take up more space overall, and they vary wildly in size. Because of that, PS memory cards jettisoned the whole block thing and used clearer terms, kilobytes. On the whole, you could probably store data for a lot more games on a PS2 memory card, but given the PS2's expansive and diverse library, it was hard to get by on just one. A number of official and unofficial methods are available for moving both PS1 and PS2 saves around, and putting them on other storage. The good news is that there's nothing nearly as esoteric as what we went through with cartridges. So rest easy knowing that you're not going to have to do any kind of soldering or hex editing with these. The easiest method when it comes to backing up PS1 save files if you're short on memory card space might have been right underneath your nose since the year 2000. Did you know that you could use a PS2 system to copy PS1 saves onto a PS2 memory card? With something like 60 times the storage space of PS1 cards, backing up my saves was a PS2 launch day event for me. But then again, Try told me that it blew his mind in 2002 when he was trying to figure out how to import a Suikoden 2 save into Suikoden 3 and discovered that you just gotta copy that PS1 save onto the PS2 memory card. 
Of course, don't forget that you can't directly load or save data on a PS2 memory card with PlayStation 1 games. You're going to have to move the saves back and forth between memory cards to actually use them. When Final Fantasy XI released on the PlayStation 2 in North America in early 2004, it was bundled with Sony's official 40-gig hard drive. Although, aside from being pre-configured by Sony, it's really just a plain old IDE hard drive. This requires not only an original fat PS2 console to use, but also a network adapter, which has the actual connections required for the hard drive to operate. Outside of a handful of games that support hard drive installation, this was a handy tool for backing up saves, even if it did seem to work excruciatingly slow. Sony's continued support for older consoles was admirable when the PlayStation 3 first launched with backwards compatibility support for PS1 and PS2 discs. Since there wasn't a memory card slot on the hardware, Sony had to release a memory card adapter that connects to the PS3 via USB. What you might not know is that any PlayStation 3 model can back up both PS1 and PS2 saves using the adapter, even those systems that removed PS2 disc support. Using the memory card adapter, you can copy files back and forth or simply dump the entire card as a new internal memory card. You can essentially generate an unlimited amount of memory cards, but they do retain the same size limitations as the originals, so you might still need to do a little bit of housekeeping. Mount the virtual card into one of the virtual slots, and these can be used with PS1 discs or digital download PS1 classics. PS1 save files can also be copied to a PlayStation Portable by connecting it via USB cable or to a Vita wirelessly using the Content Manager app. Unfortunately, downloadable PS2 classics use their own save file management, which isn't compatible with the virtual memory cards. You can't even copy these saves to a real PS2 memory card using the memory card adapter. The biggest perk with the PS3 memory card adapter is just how dead simple it makes to move your saves to external storage. If you have a FAT32 formatted USB drive laying around, select your file and copy it using the menu. Slap that in your computer and navigate the USB drive's folders to PS3, export, and then PSV. You'll find this directory to be full of files with a .psv extension. This is Sony's own encrypted save file format. The file names are not written in plain language at all. If you want to know which game is which, you're going to have to look up each code. The best resource that we found for this online is at psxdatacenter.com. Some file names are really long, but all you need to do is enter in the letter code and the first five digits that follow. Let's say you're not interested in only backing up your own save files, but you want to jump to a save point at the end of the game in something you've barely even played. Or what if you just want to have all the characters in Tekken 3 unlocked from the get-go? Websites like good old GameFAQs have loads of PSV save files to download. Drop that PSV file into the export folder on your flash drive, and it will show up when you browse to it on the PS3. From there, you can copy it to the internal memory card. <laughs> So, yeah, if you have a PlayStation 3 console and have a memory card adapter, then you pretty much got it made when it comes to preserving PS1 and PS2 saves. However, these days it's become a somewhat sought-after accessory, and it's not as cheap as you might hope. Lucky for us, though, the idea of moving save files between a memory card and a computer isn't exactly new or novel. In fact, I, along with many others, had our first taste of this in the late 90s using a DeX drive from Interact. The idea of a long-term save file backup was never apparent to me until I got my hands on a DeX drive. This little hub let me transfer save files to my PC by connecting it to a serial port and using the Dexplorer application that was packed in on a floppy disk. I backed up saves from a bunch of games, burned them to CDR, and promptly forgot about them for about a decade. When I rediscovered this archive of my past PS1 exploits, I had to see what was on this disk. Maybe I would finally be able to truly finish Final Fantasy VIII, which I'd given up on after getting stuck in the final dungeon. Except, I ran into two problems. One, I no longer had a computer with a serial port on it. And two, I also no longer had a computer with a floppy drive. I was relieved to find out that serial to USB cables are a thing, and the Dexplorer program wasn't too hard to find online. However, that program is not exactly easy to run on a modern operating system. 
And while it might be fun to experience the gaudy trim of late 90s gamer culture that oozes from its presentation, the fact is, there's a much better option these days. Enter Memcard Rex. This free PC program gives you full control over the nitty gritty of PS1 save file management and backup. Through its simply designed interface, import your individual save files or open an already created memory card file. Edit the card however you'd like and export it to the desired format. Common PS1 save file formats are supported, such as the Dex Drive's native .gme files, as well as .mcd files. These can then be easily imported into emulators like DuckStation, or even be used with the Mr. FPGA's PS1 core. Under the hardware menu, you have the option to use the Dex Drive and a couple of more involved options that I'm not really familiar with to interact with a physical memory card. A more recent beta version lets you use a PS3 memory card directly. You're gonna need to set the correct communication port via the dropdown in the preferences though. On a Dex Drive, you'll know that it's working because the green LED will turn yellow when it's being accessed. You might notice that some save files in the list appear slightly faded. These are deleted saves, but they haven't yet been overwritten in the flash memory. You can delete these permanently by formatting the slot, or you can restore it. You know, this just goes to show you that when you delete a save, it might not be truly lost yet. Some slots might have a plus in, say, linked slot. This generally means it is tied to a save that takes up more than one block. To start combining cards into genre-specific compilations or making individual cards for each game, the temp buffer option lets you copy and paste from one card to another. It's all pretty self-explanatory, but what if you have several saves for a game spread across multiple memory cards? Is it even possible to compile them onto one memory card? Well, it sorta is. Check out the identifier field. If a game uses multiple save slots, they'll generally follow some sort of pattern, which you can alter using memcard Rex. Look at Final Fantasy VII here. The identifier points to slot five, but if I change that number to 15, then it reflects in the game. But you gotta pay attention and have at least an idea of what the game allows for. Some games use different coding for their identifiers, but it shouldn't be too tough to figure out. But also, remember, not all games use all 15 slots on a memory card. In these cases, if you alter a save's identifier to something that's outside of what the game allows for, then obviously, it's not going to show up. Beyond that, Memcard Rex does allow for some save files to be hacked via plugins, but these seem to be generally game or series specific. And you know what, that stuff is a bit outside of the realm of this video, so I'm not going to get into that here, sorry. See what I mean? Memcard Rex will handle just about any challenge you might run into when it comes to PS1 memory cards. However, this is a great opportunity to plug U Enforcer's Safe File Converter website, which has become an invaluable resource for moving save files between a variety of systems and devices. PS1 saves are currently supported, as are a few others I'll be talking about throughout this episode. Now, one last device for the PlayStation 1 brings everything we've discussed full circle. The Memcard Pro from 8-Bit Mods shipped in late 2020 and is essentially a dream device for original PlayStation hardware owners. The Memcard Pro uses a micro SD card to store nearly limitless amounts of memory card files. For each virtual memory card created, you get eight channels. These are essentially empty cards that can be hot swapped and shuffled through using the buttons on the Memcard itself. A tiny built-in OLED screen shows you the name of the card mounted and which channel is active. On the SD card, each file is in the .mcd format and are sorted into directories for each card. MCD, now that's gotta look pretty familiar now, doesn't it? As we know, MCD files can be accessed and modified using memcard Rex. Seriously, one gig is equivalent to around 8,000 memory cards. So, <laughs> It is safe to say that this is likely the last memory card you're ever going to need. Shuffling through memory cards on the device might require a bit of back and forth, but the built-in Wi-Fi and web interface make things a lot more convenient. Once you connect it to your local wireless internet, you can easily mount different cards and channels until you find the save file that you need. 
You can access this interface through your phone, through your computer, whatever. And a recent update even opens up FTP access, which lets you upload and download files without having to pull the card out, which is extremely convenient. Even better is how seamlessly the MemCard Pro works with the XStation ODE mod. By utilizing a simple database file, the MemCard Pro can automatically detect what game is being played. And then it'll not only display the game's title on the OLED screen, but it'll also create a dedicated set of eight memory card channels for that specific game. It's truly amazing just how seamless the experience really is. The MemCard Pro works with PlayStation games running on a PlayStation 2, although the final 9000 revision does not supply enough power to the memory card port. So a small mod with a tiny amount of soldering is needed to get that working. Oh, and if you wanted a head start on over 400 games, check out Pez82's GitHub and download his MemCard Pro pack. At first, this made the most sense for XStation users, since it sorts everything by game ID. But the recently added Mr. version sorts everything by game name, and is ultra useful for those without a PS1 ODE. <laughs> PS2 memory cards were equipped with 8 megs of NAND memory, which was significantly more spacious than what any other systems on the market offered at the time. Perhaps attempting to quell the production of non-official memory cards, Sony employed their encryption technology called Magic Gate in PlayStation 2 memory cards. I'm guessing that Magic Gate tech was one of the reasons we never saw anything like the DeX drive on the PlayStation 2. So what exactly is our path forward then? Well, the solution is probably more easily accessible than you might imagine. The key lies in a single PS2 memory card that's been hacked with the homebrew soft mod application called Free McBoot or FMCB, as it's often referred to as. Free McBoot can be installed on most PlayStation 2 memory cards, and once configured, you just need to boot up your system with that memory card in slot one or two, and suddenly, you have a whole new world of homebrew applications at your fingertips. It's a really elegant solution that just about every PlayStation 2 system can take advantage of. There's a number of ways to install Free McBoot on a memory card, but unless you have a way to run a homebrew installer in the first place, like with a boot disk or something like that, then perhaps the path of least resistance is probably just to buy a memory card with it already installed. Seriously, they're ultra cheap, and you can get them on eBay, Amazon, and more. Once you boot a uh, free McBoot, a file browser application called Launch Elf will let you navigate to the storage devices connected to your PS2 system. These days, there's multiple versions of Launch Elf, so you might find it listed as U Launch Elf or W Launch Elf in some cases. Once in the browser, you'll see the different drives. MC0 and MC1 refer to the memory cards in slot 1 and 2 respectively. You might also see Mass on this list, which appears when you have a FAT32 formatted flash drive attached via USB. Navigate to the slot where the memory card that you use for save games is inserted. The naming scheme on these files should look familiar at this point. These are game IDs, but you can switch over to more recognizable names by hitting L1 and choosing the show content as game title and details. Now just select the folder that you want, or hit square to select everything, then hit R1 and copy. Navigate to the mass storage where your FAT32 formatted USB flash drive is inserted, and press R1 and select, oh, oh, wait a second, not so fast. I'm sure every fiber of your being just wants to select paste here, but if you have the option for it, you'll want to select PSU paste. MC paste and PSU paste are especially for save files and helps retain specific information in the save file structure. MC paste is the old version and is largely obsolete at this point. All right, and with that, boom you're done. To go back to a memory card, just reverse the process. Yeah! If you've used Free McBoot, then I'm willing to bet that you're familiar with Open PlayStation 2 Loader, or OPL as it's usually referred to. This is a homebrew program used to boot games installed on a hard drive via the network adapter. One of the benefits of using OPL, besides the obvious, is the option of using VMCs, or virtual memory cards. These can be easily generated on a per-game basis, 
and are automatically loaded when you boot a game from the installed drive. Think of it like a built-in memcard pro. VMCs are stored on a partition of the hard drive called OPL, with a little plus sign next to it. If you want to get saves from a real memory card to a VMC, it's pretty easy. Once you've created a VMC file for a game in OPL, head over to Launch Elf and find the .vmc file for the game that you just created. Hit R1 and mount that file as VMC0. Then you can copy and PSU paste to the save file in the virtual memory card. You might find yourself using PSX Data Center to match up some of the game IDs though. Oh, and a quick word of warning, some versions of Launch Elf are bugged when doing a PSU paste. If it freezes your system when you try to do this, uh, just try another version of Launch Elf and see if that'll work. It's pretty amazing just how streamlined and easy PS2 saves actually are if you have a free McBoot memory card on hand. Once you have those saves on a flash drive, there's a whole bunch of PC programs that can be used on them to do stuff like change the region, hack them, convert them for emulators, and who knows what else. So I guess the big question is, is there a Memcard Pro in the works for the PS2? Well, of course there is. I'm not sure how far off it is, but hopefully not that far. Anyways, next up, we've got the good old Nintendo 64. While most of the heavy hitter first party titles use internal backup, which we covered in the last save file preservation episode, a vast majority of the third parties made use of the controller pack, a little device that plugs into the underside of each controller. Official controller packs had 32 kilobytes of SD RAM memory, which is represented as 123 pages in game. Yes, I said SD RAM, which means that it's the mercy of a lithium battery. I went over how to swap batteries in the last save preservation episode, so all the same rules apply here. But you know, hey, it's been 25 years now, so if you want to avoid the rigmarole of swapping batteries in this thing, then the recently released Forever Pack 64 from Four Layer Technologies is a great alternative to the original because it uses non-volatile memory. So now you've got a controller pack filled to the brim with saves, ghost data, and more. How do we get this stuff off of this thing and put it somewhere safe before the battery dies? Well, the good news is that there's a ton of different options out there. The bad news is you're going to have to buy at least one device. Starting out with the cheapest option, we return once again to Interact's Dex Drive. These can be purchased for very little online these days. And I got this brand new one for something around like 20 bucks. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be an N64 equivalent to Memcard Rex, which is disappointing, but what are you gonna do? If you do choose to take this approach though, you'll have to get that Dex Drive software working on your modern PC. After trying lots of stuff, I was finally able to get it working by downloading version 2.0 of the Dex Drive software and then running it in Windows XP Service Pack 2 compatibility mode on Windows 10. Don't forget that you're going to need that serial to USB cable. One of the main perks of using the Dex Drive is that you're able to dump and restore individual save files on the controller pack. Most of the other options only allow for dumping and restoring the entire 32 kilobytes of space as a whole. I showed off the Retro 2 in the last save file preservation episode, and while this is mainly for dumping internal save files, the N64 adapter does have a couple of controller ports that you can hook up N64 pads to, and then dump the memory that's on the packs. As far as I can tell, it can only dump files to a PC, not copy the files back to the memory card, which makes it a little bit useless for our situation. The successor to the save file backup device Throne is the open source cartridge reader from Sani. This is a DIY project, but you can also purchase a pre-built version from Save the Hero Builders. The newest version, called V3 Alter, has a controller port just like the Retro N64 adapter. But in this case, you can dump and restore your files to a controller pack. I don't have one on hand myself, at least not yet. But thanks to Tito over at Macho Nacho Productions, I'm told that it's extremely easy to dump and restore save files. Just plug in the controller with the pack inserted into the port and use the buttons on the Save the Hero to navigate. Information on the OLED screen will guide you through the process, 
And just like that, you have a complete .mpk file of the controller pack's contents on your micro SD card. .mpk seem to be the standard file format for controller pack dumps, while the individual save files on the pack are called notes. If you wish to split out the contents of the MPK file to individual files, you can once again employ UN Forrester's Save File Converter website to convert each note into a raw save file. Then reverse the process to convert the raw save back into a .mpk. Another great resource for this is the MPK Edit Web Application. This tool is especially good for a game that has multiple notes that you have to wrangle, such as BlastCore. Finally, if you've purchased an EverDrive 64 from Crix, then a handy little controller pack dumper is included at the base level of the OS. Select CPAC Manager from the Z button menu via the EverDrive 64's main menu. From here, you can dump the entire controller pack's memory to the SD card in the EverDrive. You can choose to name this file based on the controller port or by the name of the last game that you played. Even though it dumps one big file the size of the entire controller pack, it's nice to have these two options, especially the second, which is great for when you want to have individual memory cards for each game. To load these MPK files back and forth between the controller pack, just navigate to the ED64 slash game data folder on the SD card, select it, and choose File to CPAC. The biggest challenge with that is that you always have to remember it to dump and load each file as you go. There is a controller pack manager UI that you can boot on the N64 EverDrive, that lets you view, copy, or delete individual files on a pack. But I gotta be honest, it's pretty unreliable and buggy. On the other hand, many games do have controller pack browsers built into them though, which are usually accessed by holding start when a game boots up. These are really just meant for clearing out space for the current game that you're playing, and really only offer the option to delete the files, not move them or copy them. The Nintendo 64 wasn't the only system where you had to plug in a memory card into the controller. Probably the most famous example of this is up next. You knew it would only be a matter of time before we got to the Sega Dreamcast. When the system was released, the Visual Memory Unit, or VMU for short, seemed to be the future of the memory card. Not only could you store save games on it, but you could also play Tamagotchi-like minigames on it thanks to a 48 by 32 LCD screen, a D-pad, and four buttons. In most cases, these games were less than engaging, but were fun to tool around with nonetheless. For myself and most others, the portability of a VMU lost its novelty upon realizing how quickly it can suck down a pair of CR2032 batteries, with a loud beep letting you know that they were dead every single time you turned on the system. A standard VMU had a total capacity of 128 kilobytes of flash memory available. Some of this space is lost to system files though, which brings it down a little bit to 100 kilobytes, or 200 blocks of usable space. Naturally, there were a number of third-party options, but again, I had a hard time trusting those. Using certain homebrew tools, it's possible to unlock up to 44 extra blocks of space per memory card. But, you know, this might prevent certain games from writing or loading save data correctly. So I always thought it was a good idea to avoid enabling that. The Dreamcast interface for copying files between VMU was really charming. But if you wanted to avoid this altogether, you could hook two VMUs together via their top ports and trade saves between them that way. A Dreamcast controller could hold two VMUs with the screen of whichever was in slot one showing through the face of the controller. This was rarely used to great effect, with the most notable example I can think of is how it showed your health in Resident Evil Co. Veronica. If you don't really care about the screen, then an official 4X memory card was released with four banks of 200 that you could cycle through. I love my 4X memory card, but it does occasionally have a problem with certain saves. For instance, Dynamite Cop will not save correctly while using one, so you'll have to opt for a standard VMU in that case. Still, the 4X is really useful, and you'll never have to worry about that horrible VMU beep. So, for a system that was so widely blown open to piracy and hacks, the Sega Dreamcast had relatively few methods for actually backing up save files. 
The first method that I researched a couple of years back was a program called Dream Shell. Burn the program to a CD and pair it with a custom-made serial to SD card reader that will let you dump saves to an SD card and load them back to the VMU. Dream Shell hasn't been updated in several years now, but apparently it is possible to get it booting if you have an ODE installed. But personally, I couldn't get it to work. That's just something you want to keep in mind if you have a mode or a GDMU in your system. But, whew, that serial to SD reader. I see that there's better made devices now, but look at how janky the one that I bought a few years back is. I was afraid it would break off in the port and I'd never be able to get it out. If you just caught the bug to start backing up your Dreamcast saves, then the easiest and most successful way of doing so is by using the Brook Wingman SD wireless controller receiver for the Dreamcast and Sega Saturn. Even though its primarily function is to let you use other controllers, like the Xbox One controller with either of these systems, the lack of a VMU slot would be problematic for the Dreamcast. So Brook had to implement its own save file storage via internal memory into the receiver itself. Although it's not necessarily the most efficient thing ever, this does give you the option of backing up the contents of the virtual VMU wholesale to a PC by using a USB cable and an app that can be downloaded from Brook's website. You can, of course, restore saves by using the same app. This does require some premeditated setup, though, because you need to know which VMU backup has a save for the game that you want to play on it, which, you know, might discourage some of you from really wanting to use it. If you want to organize your save files, or just sort everything on a per game basis, then the .vmu files created by the Brook application can be opened up in emulators or manipulated and organized in the VMU Explorer application by Spewed. Somewhere along the way, you will surely run into a game or two that won't let you copy or move the save data from one memory card to another. That's where VMU Tool comes into play. This homebrew app gives you a lot more control over how you manage the contents of the VMU such as letting you move saves that are normally locked between VMUs. If you want to compile your old Fantasy Star Online save onto another memory card, this is a good way to do it. Another cool side feature of the VMU tool is that it comes with a whole bunch of save files that can be manually loaded onto a VMU. Wrong, Jarek. This is not a brutality. This is a fatality. I'll admit that this is super handy, especially if you want to unlock all the characters really quickly in Marvel vs. Capcom 2. I wish I had more for you when it came to the Dreamcast. I really do. But I do want to mention the VM2 the next-gen VMU for the Dreamcast that is currently in the crowdfunding stage from Greece-based Dreamware Enterprises. If it's as good as it looks, then it should be the Dreamcast equivalent to the Memcard Pro. Not only does it have a rechargeable battery, but it also saves data to a micro SD card, which will pretty much make it the be-all, end-all option for VMU save preservation. I have my fingers crossed that the VM2 will put an end to the less-than-optimal situation for backing up Dreamcast saves. And now, for completion's sake, let's take a look at Microsoft's memory card offerings and whether or not they serve any real purpose to us. When the original Xbox was released in 2001, it was armed with an 8GB hard drive. Although around half of that was meant for system and game use, meant that you only had about 4.5 gigs for save data. It would be almost impossible to fill that space. The downside to this is that saves were locked to an internal storage, unless you had a memory unit. This little thing plugged into your controller and it was equipped with 8 megabytes of flash memory so you could take your save games with you to a friend's house. That 8 megs gets you about 500 blocks of space, which really isn't all that much when you consider that Halo 1 or 2 could take up all that space on their own. So the memory unit was useful to an extent, but I'm not sure how many people found it necessary. I was able to buy a still sealed one especially for this video on eBay for fairly cheap. Today the memory unit's legacy is that it's one of many pieces that paved the way for modding the original Xbox system. Its pinout configuration matched that of USB, which eventually allowed for cables to be made that let it interface directly with a PC, and things were quickly blown wide open. 
it's easy to see why the original Xbox is looked at so fondly by the console modding community. Just plug the memory unit into one of the two ports on the controller, navigate to it in the dashboard, and you can copy and move files back and forth. It's simple, really. But the fact that the port for the memory units could be so easily adapted to your typical USB-type layout is another reason that they're largely redundant these days. For much cheaper, you can just go online and buy a simple Xbox controller port plug with a USB input on it. Get a flash drive, and then just use that as your memory unit. Of course, it is easy, but I'll be the first to admit that it's not always the most reliable way to do things because it can be a bit finicky. Thing is, flash drive support is super spotty overall. It seems to work best with drives under one gig, but <laughs> those are not always the easiest thing to obtain these days. There is a list of supported drives online, so see if you can find one of those. If you have a drive that's under one or two gigabytes that's not on the list, give it a try anyways you might be surprised what you find. Another thing to keep in mind is that some games have copy protection in the save files, like the Team Ninja games after Ninja Gaiden. These can't be copied over in your basic Xbox dashboard, so you'll have to mod your system to be able to copy these. Which, <laughs> let's face it, most of you have probably done already anyways. Now once you get some of these saves copied over to the flash drive, load it up on your computer. Windows doesn't seem to recognize the formatting of the drive, so go ahead and download the free Explorer 360 app to extract the files yourself. You can also use this to load the files back on. It's just really as easy as dragging and dropping. Huh? Uh. What is this? I guess while we're at it, I'll mention the memory units for the Xbox 360 which were only necessary because Microsoft launched with two types of consoles, one of which didn't include a hard drive. In the, oh, <laughs> gee, can't believe I'm saying this, uh, more than 15 years since it first launched, updates for the Xbox 360 have allowed for standard USB flash drives to back up saves. And, you know, not to mention that Microsoft themselves give you cloud storage for your save files so that it can be used to transport save files across generations. So there's not a lot to say about the Xbox 360 memory unit. Uh, just don't worry about it and use a flash drive instead. Done. Finally, the memory card for the Nintendo GameCube is the final example I can think of when it comes to removable proprietary storage for save games on classic consoles. <laughs> The GameCube launched in 2001 with the gray-colored Memory Card 59, with the 59 signifying the number of available blocks on it. Translated into real-world sizing, this was equal to about 512 kilobytes of flash memory storage. This was especially small compared to the competition, but at least most of the early games didn't really require a significant amount of space. That is, until Animal Crossing made its way into consumers' hands and recorded a full 59 blocks, prompting Nintendo to include a dedicated memory card in the case with the game. It wasn't long before the black memory card 251 hit, with two megabytes of storage, and later, the memory card 1019 arrived with a white shell and eight megabytes of flash memory. I'm guessing that most people probably won't need anything bigger than the 251, but you'll never have any hard choices to make with the 1019. Some games do have problems with the 1019 though, but in general, they're pretty minor overall. Due to the different language character sets, you might run into issues when trying to save a Japanese region game on a card that's been formatted for English-speaking territories. In some cases, this might even format your memory card, so it's probably best practice to keep a separate memory card for Japanese region games. Backing up your GameCube memory cards is really simple and requires just one of several different devices that are up to the task. The program that you're going to need is the GameCube Memory Card Manager from Sulaku. Now to run this program, you'll need a device capable of booting the Swiss Homebrew application. Thankfully, qualifying devices are relatively cheap these days. A memory card reader such as the Action Replay adapter will work fine, as will the SD to SP2. If you're unfamiliar, that's a little thing that fits into the serial port on the bottom of the GameCube. On the more expensive end of the spectrum, 
A GC Loader ODE with the 2.0 beta firmware will work great as well. I specify the 2.0 firmware because previous versions weren't capable of writing to the SD card, only reading. So once you have one of those devices, boot into the GC Memory Card Manager, and the procedure is about as easy as you can hope for. Choose the device you want to go to, and then choose Backup. Select which card you want to back up, and let it rip. You can do them one by one, or do them all at once by pressing the R trigger. Restoring the saves is just as easy. You can also create a raw image of the card if it makes it feel safer. I guess it's always good to have a redundant backup, right? Once done, the files will be written to the MC backup directory of your SD card. Now that you got them there, you know what to do. What's really nice about this method is it allows you to move files between memory cards that are normally locked. The one that immediately comes to mind is the garage data from F0GX. Imagine having to unlock all that stuff again by playing through the story mode. Whew, I, I, no, no thank you. Of course! If the Nintendo Wii is your preferred method of playing GameCube games, then there's also a Wii version of the app that you can run if you have the Homebrew channel installed. The functionality is exactly the same, except that you can dump your saves to the Wii's built-in SD card slot. No additional hardware required. As always, I'm sure there's applications and devices that I've missed, but hey, at least now you've got a pretty decent start with backing up and sorting your save files that are locked away on proprietary memory cards. I only wish that these were around before I lost my old Fancy Star Online Dreamcast character years ago. Love them or hate them, specialized memory cards for save data on consoles was a pretty novel idea, even if they were only around for a couple of generations. They signify a time capsule of your gaming history. And now, you can make sure that you can carry that data into the future.